And on April 30, the Tribune reported that the Bulls enjoyed the largest increase in attendance in the NBA in the 84-85 season and were only one of seven teams to draw over 1 million fans for the 85 season. I'd have a sore wrist if I had to draw even 100 fans. Now, I'll edit that out. I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. (laughs) I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away, Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB85, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan's rookie season in the NBA. And now, your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to another episode of NB85. We're up to episode 27 in the series, Aaron. Thanks again for joining me, mate. How are we today? Really good, mate. NBA News, Notes and Quotes. 1985 Playoffs, Round 2. Let's get straight into it. The April 29 edition of the Chicago Tribune included a Chicago Bulls 1985 roster forecast by Bob Sakamoto. Bob acknowledged that Caldwell Jones would most likely be cut during the offseason and that Juwan Oldham and Dave Corzine were going to be adequate backups for next season, meaning that they're going to be looking for a starting pivot. He floated the idea of a trade with, and I quote, the winner of the Patrick Ewing sweepstakes, end quote, (laughs) in getting either Bill Cartwright from New York, Joe Barry Carroll from Golden State, Herb Williams or Steve Stepanovich from Indiana, or Tree Rollins from Atlanta, depending on who gets Ewing in the upcoming lottery and NBA draft. Interesting machinations there about what could have been, but although Billy did end up in the Bulls a few years hence. What could have been or what? Will be, I guess. Well, yes, true. He said the glut of power forwards would most likely make David Greenwood expendable. Steve Johnson had his best full season at power forward, and they should consider moving Sid Green to the starting five, which they actually did. He started 68 of 80 games played in the 85-86 NBA season. They are pretty settled at the two and three with MJ and Orlando, and backups such as Rod Higgins, with also the likely move of Quinton Daly. And as we've mentioned a few times, mate, Daly stayed on the roster, wasn't quite discarded as quickly as these newspaper articles may have suggested would happen. Yeah, they had him down as a dead man walking, but yeah, he was back. (laughs) He was back. The inconsistency at the point guard spot hurt the Bulls this year. Ennis Watley lost the confidence of coach Kevin Lockery after an excellent 83-84 season when he finished seventh in the NBA in assists. The article spoke of Norm Nixon and Johnny Moore being potential free agent targets. Hmm. The general consensus around the league was that the Chicago Bulls underachieved this season, and it's a view that the Bulls players also shared. And on April 30, the Tribune reported that the Bulls enjoyed the largest increase in attendance in the NBA in the 84-85 season and were only one of seven teams to draw over 1 million fans for the 85 season. I'd have a sore wrist if I had to draw even 100 fans. Now, I'll edit that out. Um, The first series mate, we'll cover here is the West's number one seed, the LA Lakers. They opened their second round series against the number five seed, Portland Trailblazers. The Lakers took the series in five games. They won it four games to one with an average winning margin of almost 16 points a game. Portland's sole victory was in game four of the series at home, and they had an eight-point win. And the Lakers' lowest score in this series in games that they won was 125. Uh, Showtime. Magic and Kareem averaged 21 points per game or better during this series, and the Magic Man averaged an incredible 17 assists per game. The next highest assist man was Michael Cooper. He had 19 assists in total over the five games. So Magic was serving up dimes on a plate. Don't even know if that makes sense, but we'll go with it. Kiki Vanderway led the Blazers in scoring, averaging 19.8 points a game. And second-year man, Clyde Drexler, he shot poorly, only about 35% from the field. But overall, he enjoyed a very good series, averaging 15 points, 5.2 rebounds, 9.2 assists, 3 steals, and 1.4 blocks a contest. And this series ended on May the 7th. Hashtag line by line. (laughs) The only way to do it, mate. 
Now, on the 28th of April, Philadelphia opened their series. They were the number three seed in the East, and they decimated the number two seeded Milwaukee Bucks in a sweep four games to nil. Now, the series wrapped up on May the 5th almost as quickly as it actually began. Games two and three were decided by just nine total points, but the 76ers had a 22-point win in game one, and they had a comfortable nine-point win in the clinching game four. That's what you get for betting the Bulls in the first round, Milwaukee. That's right. So even though they had the number two seed because they were in the central division, Philadelphia certainly made short work of the Bucks. Moses Malone dominated the pivot for the 76ers with 25 points, 9.5 rebounds and 1.5 blocks per contest. And if my calculations are correct, courtesy of the wonderful basketballreference.com, Charles Barkley had a super series and he raised the level of his game significantly and had better numbers in this series in almost every category than he did the regular season. He averaged almost 18 points. He had 9.3 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 2.5 steals, and 1.5 blocks per game. The good doctor, Julius Irving, at age 34, averaged better than 16 points, 6 rebounds, and 4 assists as well. For the young bucks, no pun intended, (laughs) Terry Cummings... Averaged 25.5 points, 8.3 rebounds, 2.3 assists, and 2.3 steals a game, even though they got swept. There's some fantastic numbers. Sid Moncrief scored almost 20 points a game. Paul Pressey was his ever-reliable self with almost 16 points a game, along with 7.5 rebounds and 8.8 assists per game. And Alton Lister had a double-double, 10.5 points and 10 rebounds per game. On uh, May 5th, apparently at the centre of all of the many coaching change rumours is one man, Stan Albeck. In the shuffling of the coaching deck chairs, Bob reported that, I just called him Bob, like we're at the point now where I think everyone knows who Bob is. We have to thank Bob again for his incredible contributions to this series. Of course, he was a great reporter here with the Chicago Tribune for this entire season and we've gleaned innumerable topics and discussion points from many of his articles, along with Sam Smith too. Yeah, Bob was a a very humorous wordsmith. I think you'd agree with that, Adam. Oh, definitely. He reported that Suns assistant coach Al Bianchi, is it Al Bianchi or Al Bianchi? No, I'll go Bianchi. Al Bianchi, who is a friend of Jerry Krause, might be on the Bulls' radar. Bianchi was selected by the Bulls in the NBA expansion draft of 1966 for the new Bulls franchise, but never actually played a game for them. He immediately retired as a player and became the assistant to the first head coach of the Bulls, Johnny Red Kerr. Now that is a good tidbit, if I've ever heard a tidbit. Good job. And if you want to hear another cool tidbit, Al Bianchi's nickname, Blinky. Blinky Bianchi. Blinky Bianchi. Is that serious? Yes. (laughs) Another name that keeps popping up was Phil Jackson, who has done an outstanding job in the CBA. That Jackson played under Red Holzman at the Knicks was considered to be a factor as Jerry Reinsdorf wants to bring Holzman's style to the Bulls. Krauss named Phoenix's John McLeod, Portland's Jack Ramsey and Stan Albach as current NBA coaches in the Holzman mold. On May 6th, one college coach gave the Tribune a hot tip that both Patrick Ewing and Georgetown head coach John Thompson will be in Seattle next season. It's extraordinary. I actually remember combing over that article in my research as well and had forgotten about it until you brought it up again then. Imagine the uh, repercussions if that actually had happened. Well, little did he know that his prophecy came half true, albeit 15 years later in the (laughs) 2000-2001 NBA season when Patrick suited up for the Sonics for a season. That's right. The oft-forgotten Seattle Sonics experiment uh, with Patrick Ewing. I reckon that would be a great topic for an episode. Great NBA players who have just those you know, last season or two. Elijah won with the Raptors. Yeah, Dominique with Orlando, et cetera, et cetera. That'd be a cool topic for a podcast. We must do it. <laughs> um, now, the next series we want to quickly touch on, mate, was the second-seeded Denver Nuggets. They opened their series against the six-seeded Utah Jazz. Now, how's this for a game one stat line? I want you to try and identify who this player is. 19 points, 16 rebounds, and 18 assists. Who do you think that was in game one of this series? My goodness. Um 19 points, 16 boards, 18 assists. Denver versus Utah. What a main man, is it? Fat Lever? Hashtag Fat Love. <laughs> exactly. Wow. This is Fat Lever's stat line in game one. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? He's about 6'3". 
Six three. And he's pulled down sixteen boards. Yeah, if you don't mind. Hmm. That's why we love him so. One of the many reasons. Utah were without seven foot four Mark Eaton. Shameless self promotion time. Former podcast guest in allairness.com slash forty nine. Now he injured himself in game five of the first round series against the Houston Rockets and he had to have surgery and set out the rest of the Jazz's playoff campaign. Utah's only victory in this series came in game three. It was their first game at home. The Nuggets had a 12-point win in the fifth game, 116 to 104, that iced the series. The Nuggets' Alex English was a scoring machine in this series. He averaged a hefty 30.6 points a game. Calvin Natt averaged almost 23 points a game. 1985 All-Star. Indeed he was. And Lafayette Fat Lever averaged triple-double. 17 points, 11 rebounds, and 10.3 assists. Hashtag justified fat love. (laughs) Extraordinary performance. What a great effort. For the Jazz, Adrian Dantley, I've got here on my notes, perhaps the 1980s most underrated scorer. Just check out his basketballreference.com player page at some stage. Just some incredible numbers. He averaged 26 points plus almost nine rebounds a game. And four other Jazz members, Daryl, Dr. Duncan Stein Griffith, Ricky Green, Big T, Thurl Bailey, and Jeff the Franchise Wilkins averaged at least 10 points a game. And if you're wondering how rookie John Stockton fared, in 19.4 minutes a game, had just under eight points, three rebounds, five assists, and two steals a game. Now, the series ended on May the 7th. Of these players I'm about to mention, see if you can tell me who has the made-up nickname. Are you ready? Bring it on. Daryl, Dr. Duncan Stein Griffith, Thel, Big T Bailey, Jeff, the franchise Wilkins, Little, John Stockton, and Ricky, don't call me Literial Green. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I know that Hot Rod Hunley did call John Stockton Little John. So, of course, and given the farcical nature of Ricky Green's <laughs> alleged nickname, I'd fair to say it's Ricky, don't call me Lateriel Green. <laughs> uh, NBA nicknames is another future podcast episode. Ah, that will happen. Hashtag Atomic Dog. <laughs> <laughs> Audi Norris, episode 26 of this series. On May 7th, a Tribune article spoke of the rise of the image of the NBA as the league's TV deal had increased from only $400,000 in the 1979-80 season to $11 million in the 85-86 season. Hmm. It was also the only pro league in the US that posted higher ratings in 1985 than five years beforehand. Interesting numbers there. David Stern's reply to the encouraging figures was, and I quote, it's certainly better to be desirable than undesirable, (laughs) end quote. Nice work. He said there were a number of decisions that had carried the NBA from the trash heap to the forefront of sports on TV. These were limiting the number of games that a team could broadcast on its own superstation, such as WGN, in any season to 41, This prevented an oversaturation that was believed to drive down the ratings of college basketball and football in previous years. 41 games at a maximum on a team's own station. Yeah. That's still a pretty decent number. Back in 85 as well. Yeah. Yeah. Chicago station was Sports Vision at that stage. WGN, of course, as well, as you said. You know what WGN stands for? Oh, jeez, I did. Uh, I did know this, but no, I, I can't remember. What is it? World's Greatest Newspaper. Really? Are you having me on? No. No, oh, serious. Deadly serious. No, I didn't know what it was then <laughs> because that's not what I expected to hear. That's what I was told when I was over there in, in February of this year. After the recording of this episode, I will be checking that to make sure that uh, I haven't made a complete fool out of myself. But yeah, that's what I was told. <laughs> the restriction of cable broadcasts of games to within a 75-mile radius of the home arena, making the game available to a lot of people in the US on network TV. Hmm. The less is more concept was reiterated when the league asked CBS to broadcast just five games in 1983 and then eight in each of the next two seasons. Then buoyed by improved ratings, CBS telecasted 11 in the 1985 NBA season. Hello to Todd Spear if you're listening. As we speak, Todd's actually amassing a games broadcast on TV document where he's poured over hours and hours of research to come up with a list of who broadcast what throughout the 1980s and 1990s particularly. 
Yes, we're very thankful for Todd's issues that he has. They're good issues, though. This policy led to the lucrative two-year, $22 million deal with Turner Broadcasting that the NBA was currently enjoying. The NBA followed the lead of other leagues in having sponsors promote various events, such as the Miller Genuine Draft All-Star Voting and the Chic Legends Game. And the last point was the institution of a salary cap, which led to the NBA making money. After just three seasons prior, it lost $20 million. Plus, had four of its teams facing liquidation, and another six were up for sale with no buyers on the horizon. Dicey times indeed. So it's no understatement to say that Stern was definitely a key reason in helping the league progress to where it actually was by the time he handed over the commissionership to Adam Silver. Mm. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> got lost there in uh, NBA history past. <laughs> um. The next series that we'll quickly chat about, mate, was the East's number one seed, the Boston Celtics. They commenced their series against the number four seeded Detroit Pistons on the 28th of April. The Pistons won the series in six games. It was the longest of the four semifinal rounds. The series opener was a 34-point Boston route. And then Detroit won games three and four at home to even the series. However, the Celtics won the next two matchups and closed it out in game six with a 123-113 to victory. Just in regards to the 85 Detroit Pistons, I found a little tidbit in the other Tribune on May 10th. The company that had previously insured, the Pontiac Silverdome, had cancelled its policy after the roof collapse that occurred on March the 4th. Authorities from the Silverdome said that they were going to have to find a new insurer for the stadium before its reopening in August of that year. So I'm assuming that the game's three and four wins at home were at Joe Lewis Arena. Yeah, that's true. We did reference in previous episodes that they played at Joe Lewis Arena and was it Kobe Hall? Kobo. Kobo. Kobe. (laughs) Oh, goodness. Not surprisingly, in this series, Larry Legend was a standout for the Celtics, averaging 28.2 points a game, 10.2 rebounds, and 6.3 assists throughout the series. Mikhail and Parrish, the other two members of the Big Three, were the next highest scorers for Boston. Detroit were led by Isaiah Thomas. His stat line read 25.5 points a game, 6 rebounds, 10.8 assists, and 2.3 steals per contest. Vinnie Johnson, Kelly Chapuka, Bill Lambier, Terry Tyler, and John Long all averaged over 10 points per game. Now, this series concluded on May the 10th. A couple of NBA awards were announced in the last few days of this second round series that we're chatting about. The NBA announced on May the 7th that Don Nelson was named NBA Coach of the Year, and this was the second time he'd won the award in just the last three years. The Bucks went 59-23 and 23 in the regular season. And on May the 9th, Mark Eaton was named the NBA's Defensive Player of the Year. He received 32 votes in all. The Bucks, Sidney Moncrief and Paul Pressey finished second and third respectively. They totaled 23 votes between them. So that shows you how dominant Mark Eaton was. Speaking of dominant, here's one of the most incredible stats in NBA history. Exactly. Eaton smashed the NBA record for blocks in a single season, 456. And also, here's a great Mark Eaton fact and stat that I read from one of the articles about his Defensive Player of the Year. He scored 53 points in total in his 30-game collegiate career at UCLA. Okay, the 456 blocks is just being trumped by that. That's, That's a ripper. That's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. 53 points in 30 games. So in this 85 NBA season, he averaged 5.6 blocks per game. So like his block shot average for this season was about four or five times that of his scoring average in college. <laughs> Quite a remarkable stat. And when I did read that, I was pleased that uh, we could include it in this episode. On May 10, the Tribune's Odds and Ends reported that whilst GM of the Bulls, Rod Thorne had accepted an invitation to speak at his alma mater, the University of West Virginia, at a banquet on Saturday, May the 10th. Thorne told the school that the only reason he could see that he wouldn't be able to attend was if the Bulls were still in the playoffs. He added that he didn't think there was much chance of that happening. (laughs) At least he's honest. Very. We're almost at the end of the episode, mate. Some of the individual highs for this second round of the NBA playoffs in 1985. Larry Bird dropped 42 points 
on the Detroit Pistons on the 30th of April. The captain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, pulled down 17 rebounds at Portland on the 5th of May. And Magic Johnson, not surprisingly, had the highest number of assists in this period of time, 23 at Portland on the 3rd of May. So there you go, mate. That's the second round of the NBA playoffs. We haven't gone as detailed this time around, mostly due to the fact that the Bulls had exited in round one, let's be honest. Also, I think it's just good to have a, an overall recap of these following series without going into the line-by-line minutia that some people have come to expect. Nothing worse. Terrible. In the never-ending search for content for this MB85 podcast series, I wanted to get the opportunity to speak to someone who actually attended games at Chicago Stadium in this 85 season and got the chance to see Michael Jordan play as a rookie. So when I was in Chicago back in February of this year, I took the opportunity to contact Mark Silverman, a.k.a. Sylvie, from the, the Waddle and Sylvie show on ESPN 1000 to see if I could organise a time to to sit down with him and ask him a few questions about watching this 1985 edition of the Chicago Bulls and MJ as a rookie. Here is that audio, mate. So thanks again for recording it and thanks to Sylvie for making himself available too. First of all, Sylvie, thank you very much, mate, for some time uh, on the NB85 podcast. You're a uh, Chicago guy and uh, wanted to get your point of view on your own personal experience with the 1984-85 Chicago Bulls. You know, it's funny. You've come the furthest distance ever to interview me. So you've got that going for you, if that's anything going for you. You're welcome. (laughs) Now, what age were you when you first started going to Bulls games? When I first started going to Bulls games, my first game, I was four years old. It was the mid-70s. I I was born in 71. Uh, My grandfather was a season ticket holder in their first year in 1966-67. They used to play before the stadium at the International Amphitheater, which is no longer there. He got in on the ground floor, you know, before the Bulls got really popular. Jerry Sloan, Norm Van Lair, Bob Love, Chet Walker, that team, Dick Mata's team, was very big and really hooked him in, and he started taking me probably when I was four or five years old. We actually sat on the floor at the old Chicago Stadium. Before they were any good, this isn't like the high rollers seats like they are today. You know, I mean, those were probably just a few bucks more, and, you know, we used to sit on the floor, and there were probably maybe two or 3,000 people at these games total. How long did he have the season tickets for? Well, my grandfather had them, and then the older he got, my uncle, his son, took them over. Passed and, them on. And, right. Yeah. So, and, and he kept them, I want to say, till about the mid-2000s. Okay. So, oh, so, so yeah, I mean, they, they were in the family for a long, long time. Now, back when you first started going, were they the old wooden seats, or had they progressed to the uh, red it, padded seats? It was like a fold-up chair, basically. Yeah. It was like a red padded fold-up chair. I bought three while... Oh, did you? Yeah, I've got to take him home with me now, so it, it, wish me mean, luck. There's no cooler spot than the Chicago Stadium. Mm. Yeah, I grew up going to Wrigley, and, and maybe because I still get to go to Wrigley, I don't appreciate it as much as the old Chicago Stadium. It was, uh, it, it, it was a building unlike anything you see today. I mean, when we used to sit on the floor, all you had to do was lift the temporary carpeting up, and then there was the ice. There was nothing, no barrier between... Insulation, no insulation. Nothing. It was a carpet laid over ice on the floor for us. So it was a pretty incredible time. My co-host, Adam, was lucky enough to see a game at the stadium on a a tour that he did back in 1994. It's it's last season while he was there, and I will hold that against him until the day I die. Yeah. Yep. How many games did you see during the 84, 85 season at the stadium, what do you think? You know, and I don't even know for sure. I would guess probably about 5 to 10. I really, the older I got, the more games I started going to. My senior year in high school, which was 88, 89, I went to 39 of the 41 regular season Uh, games. Oh, wow. So I probably went to 10, and I was really into the Bulls even before... Jordan came. I mean, I loved Orlando Woolridge. I loved Reggie Theus before before that, David Greenwood. I used to think when 5,000 people would get into the, the stadium that it would be loud. And, you know, even during Jordan's rookie year, it was consistent where there would only be 10,000, 12,000. Yep. And, and I would think that was a big crowd. That was going to be my next question was, 
the only games at the stadium during that season that drew any half decent crowds were the, against the marquee teams against the 76ers in Boston and LA. Why, even with his amazing start to that season, do you think that the other fans just didn't turn up? The Bulls just weren't the Bulls yet. There wasn't the tradition of uh, kids going to games with, uh, like my grandfather was in the minority of having Bulls season tickets. They, that's what I mean when I say we sat on the floor because they didn't have even really enough people who even wanted to sit on the floor back in the day. And, and they were so bad through the late 70s into the early 80s that this was a Hawks town in the 60s yeah. and 70s. And, and, and really basketball didn't pick up steam until Jordan. And I think one reason why the Bulls are so popular today is it's all the kids who grew up during the Jordan years who now have stayed loyal. And that's, look, that's how any franchise gets started. The Bears, one generation to the next. And I think with with Bulls fans now, they're as passionate as any because they grew up through some really good times. I'd also heard about that the other fans may have been a bit mentally scarred from you know a few potential stars that didn't quite live up to expectations. So... Maybe they may have seen MJ early and how good he was, but maybe didn't buy into it as much. You know, I remember, too, it's a funny story, because I was so into them. And in 84, that was the Olympic year. Mm. Um, Bob Knight, I think, coached the U.S. Olympic team in 84, and they won the gold medal. Um, and I just remember that summer being so tuned into the Olympics, trying to figure out how good Michael Jordan was. You know, we got Michael Jordan coming, and, and it was great, and we were really excited but no one, no one knew that Michael Jordan was Michael Jordan. And, and then it just started. He just started doing things on the court that we've never, ever, ever seen anyone do on the court before. One thing I've seen is from the way that he played in the Olympics, the, the hype surrounding MJ before he played his first game here in Chicago was pretty huge. By today's standards, no. Well, I mean, no. well, for back then, like, yeah, the expectations were quite high. Yeah, well, I don't know even if they were that high. There were things, it was a total transition time for basketball because, we, like I said, we saw a lot of bad basketball. And the things that we started seeing Jordan do, there was Dr. J, sure. No one ever talked about hang time. And then when Jordan came in his rookie year, people, I remember being in junior high, starting to talk about hang time. On the way Jordan, the way he just hung in the air. And then obviously the air Jordan uh, happened. And then the double clutch dunks and, and different things like that. And everything he did was new. So, like, there was no hype of knowing what was to come. Because every time he was on the floor, he did something new that none of us ever saw before. I've got every single game from his rookie season that is available in trading circles at the moment. So I think there's about 20 or 22 games that I've got. And in watching those games, you can just see how far ahead of everyone else on the court he is. Just from an athletic standpoint, he was not just one notch, he was two or three notches athletically above everyone else. Yeah, the, the swag, too, that he brought, Yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously. Um, I, there was one, I don't know if you watched... This game, if this was, I believe this game was from his rookie year, and I remember watching. I think they were playing the Clippers in L. I don't even yeah. know if they were in San, if they the were in San Diego or in LA. Eighty-four, eighty-five was their first season in LA. So the play that I always remember was the one where they tried to foul him, yeah. and they grabbed him and basically bear hugged him or grabbed him with one arm, and he still was able to get the shot off and scored while getting fouled. And those were the types of plays yeah. that. They were just unheard of, so no one really knew what was going to happen next. And you could hear the excitement in the announcers' voices. That game that you're speaking of in the LA against the Clippers, Bill Hazen was the, the caller for the Bulls on that game, mm -hmm. and you can just hear the excitement in, in their voices because it's all brand new to them, and they just could not believe what was happening on the court in front of them. It, that's the thing. It was just such a new thing. I still remember this vividly. I was probably, I don't know, seven, eight years old. My grandfather said, we're going to go to the Bulls game tonight. We're going to see a guy fly, and it's Dr. J. And <laughs> I'll always remember that. I still remember that. Yeah. And he was the first, really. Dr. J was like the first basketball player who took it to another level, where it wasn't just jump shots and layups, and that it was a guy actually taking off and doing special things. And Jordan took what Dr. J did and just went it to the 10th degree.
I've seen a few games from back in the early 80s, and yeah, I agree that just MJ's his body control and his creativity, especially what everyone talks about you know, Air Jordan, but his creativity in mm-hmm. the air, it, it definitely it set him apart even from Julius Irving, I thought. And, and he was competitive from the moment he started. Yeah. And there were some rivalries even, I'm sure you guys know about, I think it was his rookie year in the All-Star game where there were a lot of jealousies from him wearing the Air Jordan gear during the dunk contest, or even within the Bulls team, where a guy like Orlando Woolridge, who I told you that I liked, um, was jealous, really, of Jordan, of all the publicity that he was getting. Quentin Daly, as well, was well, another well, one. Yeah, right? Quentin, Daly, with it. Quentin Daly had more problems than just Jordan. I mean, that he was a troubled guy, and, and you know there were a lot of guys, the story goes, I was very young at the time to know, a lot of guys on that first and second year teams of Jordan who weren't great guys who there were drug issues and drugs were rampant in the NBA at that time and they weren't besides Magic and Bird and Doc the big stars there were today so there was a almost a criminal element to some of the players on the Bulls team and Jordan thank goodness kept his distance from those guys in one of our early episodes we interviewed Sam Smith and Sam said that Quentin Daly was the only NBA player in history who's been met with a a picket by before his rookie game, the they, men's group because of the, what happened in college with with the rape allegations and yeah. everything like that. Yeah. People were picketing out. I still remember this too as a young kid outside the Chicago Stadium when he was a rookie. And Quentin Daly actually was not, not a bad player, and he was a really good shooter, great sixth man, and he was just a, a really really troubled guy. As yeah. were a few, probably a handful of those guys were were troubled guys on those Bulls teams. Agreed. It was that era of the NBA. Thanks. Really, really appreciating the other time, mate. I've got one more question sure. for you. With the other players of that era being a lot more accessible, did you ever have any, any personal interaction yeah, with any lot, of that squad? Yeah, a lot. You know, it's funny you bring that up because some of my great memories was there was a restaurant up in the northern suburbs. I grew up uh, 15 miles north of Chicago in the town called Skokie. And there was a restaurant just north of that in Northfield called Danny's. And weekly, they used to have a radio show, the Orlando Woolridge Show. They would broadcast it. Jimmy Pearsall was the host. Jimmy Pearsall was an old-school baseball player, played for the Red Sox, announced the White Sox game, turned into a radio personality, and he would host the Orlando Woolridge Show. So, you know, going up in the 80s, at a young age, I knew I wanted to be on the radio. It was like killing two birds with one stone. I would get to see how a radio show was going on, and... I would get to meet Orlando Woolridge every week and get autographs and, and things like that. And his rookie year, Jordan came up as a guest. 50 people, maybe, 40 people at this. But, yeah, if you wanted to meet Bulls players, it was that, a really easy time to meet them. Well, you mentioned that there may have been only around either 50 people at the appearance, but it's in tone with looking at the attendances of the games. Like, there's some games during that season where you'd have six or 7,000 people and... And, and now, in hindsight, hindsight's a very handy thing. You can look back on it, but it's just, it seemed absolutely extraordinary. Look, we live in a different world yeah. that if, even if the Bulls weren't that popular in Chicago right now, and they had a player like Jordan to come through, there would be way different ways to spread the word quicker about who this Michael Jordan was. There were no ESPN games back in the day. Mm. You know, uh, the, the NBA had a very small national TV package. You know, now if you see something special, it's everywhere. You know, you follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can tweet me. I can get you guys something as quickly as you can get something from Chicago. Back then, there was no way of doing that. There was none. So, you know, with social media, with the way you can s- spread the word about who's where now and, and what's going on in different arenas, it's a lot easier to, to get the snowball rolling downhill compared to back then. Beautiful. Sylvie, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And uh, thank you. Australia loves you. I don't know about that. (laughs) Giddy up. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at in all airness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash in all airness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.